In this video, we'll take a look at two more squeeze theorem related problems and show you how they work. Particularly, these problems will not involve trig functions, so it'll be a little different into how we are doing the squeeze theorem. We'll work through them and see how all they all come together. So here's our first problem. Use the squeeze theorem to evaluate limit as x goes to two, x squared minus three x plus two, all times x minus two over absolute value of x minus two. So what's the problem here? Well, the issue is that absolute value fraction. Right, that fraction, that limit does not exist. This is one of the standard examples you saw earlier in this chapter, but it's one on one side and negative one on the other because of the absolute value function, so that limit there does not exist. But what do we know about that function? Well, just like from before, that ratio there is either minus one or one. Right? If x is bigger than two, that is just one, because it ends up being three minus two over three minus two, it's one. If x is less than 2, I get minus 1, which means that, like we had for the sine function, I can write something like this. I could write an equal sign here, but for, the, for symmetry with the other examples, we'll leave with a less equal sign. So the absolute value of that fraction there is at most 1. Now let's play the same game we did from before with this setup here. So let's multiply by the absolute value of whatever we have left over. With our function here. So if we do that, we get the following. And I can again unpack the absolute value to get me a double inequality like I did before. So there's that. And again, this gives us good candidates for our L and U functions because it satisfies the appropriate inequalities you want them to. The last thing we have to do is check the limits of these L and U functions and see if they match. If they match, we're good, we're done, squeeze them, apply. So for L, this you could split into two parts for a bigger than two and less than two, or you can just plug in and see that this goes to zero when I plug in two, right? I get four minus six plus two. This is zero. And similarly, the U of X function also goes to zero. So because these two things equal and the inequalities up here are satisfied, squeeze them applies and the limit of the whole function is zero. And there's our final answer. This problem works fairly similar to the trig problems. Again, all the squeeze theorem problems are fairly similar. Just depends how you need to handle what you see in the statement. So in this case, instead of having a trig function, I had a fraction that I knew was either one or minus one. So I could apply the same sort of techniques once I get the appropriate bound in place. Our second example here for today is a more conceptual one where you're not given a formula for F, you're just told what property it satisfies. So assume I have a function f that I know is bounded between 2x minus 1 on the lower side and x squared on the upper side for all x except 0 and 1. And I want, I'm asked, what does it say about the limit at 0 and the limit at 1? So if we were to draw the graph of these functions, you'd see this is what that picture looks like. So you have 2x minus 1 sitting below the parabola, so it's okay for function f to live in here. And I want to know if f lives in here somewhere, what does that say about the limit at zero and the limit at one. So if you're in the squeeze theorem section, you probably guess you're trying to apply a squeeze theorem here. But if not, it might not be obvious at first. The fact that we have an inequality chain here should sort of lead you towards thinking squeeze theorem. Let's try to apply a squeeze theorem at both these points and see what happens. Let's just take limits of these L functions and U functions and see what I get and see what I can conclude from there. So we'll call this guy L of X. And we'll call this guy u of x because our f sits in between them. So let's look at 0 and 1 and write all, all, the, all the numbers and then we'll talk what they mean. At x equals 0, I can compute a limit for l of x. That's a continuous function, so I can just plug in the limit there and get the answer. And I can do the same thing for u of x. All right, we'll leave that for now. Let's do the same for 1 and then we'll talk about what goes on here. So at 1, I can do the limits for l and u as well. So what happens here? Well, at one, we notice that these two numbers are equal. Them being equal is exactly what the squeeze theorem needs to apply. So at one, squeeze theorem applies, which means that the limit of f of x exists and must be one because we have the inequalities from up here, and we have the limits being equal from down here. 
what happens at zero? Well, at zero, these numbers are not equal, which means the squeeze theorem does not apply. And so this says nothing about that limit. So the limit might exist. This function could be totally smooth and continuous and not care, and so the limit's fine. Or there could be a jump for the limit not to exist. Right? It is possible for the graph of f to look like the following. Something like that. That is entirely possible. That is a case where the limit at 0 does not exist, but the limit at 1 does. That's just one example. That's entirely possible. It's also possible for this limit to exist, but the theorem says nothing about it, so we're okay. So even though we had the inequalities, we didn't have the matching limit at 0, so we could not conclude the limit existed and equaled some number. At 1, however, we did have matching numbers, and so we could conclude from the squeeze theorem that the limit had to be. So this problem here gives you more conceptual feels to knowing what are the conditions, what do they mean, and how do they apply to each other to make sure that the squeeze theorem still works. All right, so that's it for this video. In the next one, we'll talk about the trigonometric limits and how you can prove that they are what they are using the squeeze theorem.